So first and foremost, I'd like to begin with the month of Ramadan itself, looking at briefly the virtues of the month of Ramadan in terms of the arrival of the month of Ramadan and the sighting of the new moon of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with this month of Ramadan, which is one of the months of the 12 Arabic months. It is a month which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has singled out specifically in his deen. It is a month which is distinguished from other months by many characteristics and virtues. Alhamdulillah, we know from the Sunnah of the Prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in the Quran regarding this month of fasting. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليسم This is in Surah Al-Baqarah Translation of which is The month of Ramadan in which was revealed the Quran A guidance for mankind and clear proofs for the guidance and the criteria between right and wrong so whoever of you cites the crescent on the first night of the month of Ramadan, meaning whoever is present in the home, then that person, he must observe the siyam, the fasting for that month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month revealed his last message, Al-Quran, to the human being and jinn. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qadr, that indeed verily in this night or in this night yani, was sent down the Quran so the night was the night of Qadr and in this night the Quran was sent was revealed to the last and final Prophet and Messenger of Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also in this month we mentioned besides the revelation of Quran you find here the night of power, Laylatul Qadr. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily, we have sent down this Quran in the night of Al Qadr. And what will you make what will make you know what the night of Al Qadr is? The night of Al Qadr is better than a thousand months. Meaning, if you have spent one thousand months, eighty-three point three years, worshipping Allah, if you found that night, that would be the equivalent reward. SubhanAllah. Ramadan itself is an action which is rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically. And whoever uses the time of fasting, praying in its nights, fasting in its days, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that person will provide forgiveness for their sins. And this is found in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ who said, whoever fasts Ramadan out of faith and in the hope of reward, his previous sins will be forgiven. Hadith which is in Bukhari Muslim. And also from the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever spends the nights of Ramadan in prayer, out of faith and in the hope of reward, his previous sins will be forgiven. So without doubt, alhamdulillah, each and every one of us were incurring sins day by day. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us with a chance, a great opportunity for those sins to be erased in this month. In this month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the gates of paradise. And he closes the gates of Jahannam, hellfire. And he chains up the devils. As is found in the hadith of the Prophet that when Ramadan comes, the gates of paradise are opened. And the gates of hell are closed. And the devils are chained up. Incidentally, regarding this, the shayateen being chained up, question was asked to the scholars that if that is the case, if all the devils are chained up, then how is it people can still do bad actions in the month of Ramadan? And they replied that these are the, the big shayateen. But some small devils may be working. And also we have the, our own qareen within us, who whispers to us to do things, gives waswasa to us. So that is a reason. Not every single shayateen is chained up, but the big ones are chained up. But there may be a few small ones, and of course, our Qareen, our companion, our inner companion. Another benefit of this month is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
He saves, he redeems people from the fire, from Jahannam. Those who would be going to Jahannam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them guidance, guides them to the right way, and that their path will then be towards Jannah by the righteous good deeds and actions and the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu Again, we find the hadith of Rasulullah who said, Allah has people whom he redeems every night and day, meaning in Ramadan. And every Muslim every night and day has a prayer that is answered. So in this month, we should be taking the opportunity to make plenty of dua, forgiveness, asking for guidance, asking for his mercy, asking for his blessings. We said that this month is a month of forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the sins which were committed since the previous Ramadan and this Ramadan. Just as the five daily prayers are a forgiveness from one Jum'ah to the next, similar Ramadan, as the Prophet said in the meaning of the hadith, that from one Ramadan to the next are expiation for sins committed in between, so long as you avoid the major sins. The reward for fasting in this month the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever fasts in Ramadan, a month is like 10 months. So this equivalent, let me ask you a question here. How is one month like 10 months? We fast one month of Ramadan, but how is it like 10 months? Anybody care to provide an answer? 10 times reward. Jazakallah khair. Because in this month, any action you do, the minimum reward that you will get is what? 10 rewards, 10 times whatever you do. Up to, who was listening in the khutbah today? Between 10 and 700. Any action you do, except for fasting, Allah will give whatever He wants above that. But here, for the month of whatever we do, Alhamdulillah. So a minimum, the month of Ramadan is like 10 months. And of course, those who complete the month of Ramadan and follow it up with six days of Shawwal, okay, after Eid al-Fitr, they will get the reward of a complete year. Anyone care to do the maths on that one? No? Khair, inshallah. We'll leave that to you. When Ramadan arrives, we need to make preparation for this. Throughout the year, we've been busy with our lifestyles. We've been running around doing this and doing that. In fact, some of the scholars, they likened Ramadan like the brakes of a car. When a car drives without brakes to, con to, to help to control it, what would happen to that car? It would crash. It would damage the car, it may damage the injure, injure the driver, it may injure somebody, it may kill even, cause a fatality. So Ramadan, the fasting we do in Ramadan are similar to, the analogy is similar as that they are the brakes of our desires. It helps to control our nafs, helps to keep us on track. And of course, the key reason why we fast is so that we may become muttaqi, be those who are fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we enter this month, we should seek Allah's repent. We should seek repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to clean our hearts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That all of you beg Allah to forgive you all, O believers, that you may be successful. When we enter into Ramadan, we don't want to go with sins. We want to go in with good rewards. And this is one of the reasons why the scholars explain this month of Sha'ban is a precursor to Ramadan of doing good deeds, getting trained up for Ramadan. Otherwise, people find it very difficult just to go straight into Ramadan like that. So this is one of the reasons why the Prophet encouraged us to fast the month of Sha'ban, the month before Ramadan. In fact, he وسلم, used to fast most that month, save a little bit. According to the hadith of Aisha, radhu anha. So, asking Allah for forgiveness, seeking His repentance, this should be one of the things that we do to, to when, we, when Ramadan arrives. Also, other preparations. We should be 
increasing our dua supplications. The pious predecessors, as Salaf as Salihun, they used to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala six months beforehand that they would live to see Ramadan. Then after Ramadan, five months after it gone, they'll be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making dua that He would accept that Ramadan from them. The actions done. So we need to increase our dua our supplications. Also, it is a blessed month. We should rejoice in this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Say in the bounty of Allah and in His mercy, meaning Islam and the Quran, therein let them rejoice. That is better than what? The wealth that they, wealth that they amass. So alhamdulillah, we should be happy for this joyous, this blessed month to come to us, that we can reap from its benefits, take advantage of getting Allah's forgiveness, increase our iman, increase our taqwa, our fearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, following the sunnah of Prophet If any of us have any outstanding fasts from the previous Ramadan, then it is an obligation that we complete, we make up those, for example, if we're able to, Make those up, if we're able to, before we enter into the next Ramadan. And this is what the Prophet well, Aisha, sorry, Aisha used to say, I would all fast from the previous Ramadan. I would not be able to make them up except in Sha'ban. So the latest, of course, is Sha'ban before Ramadan. If you need to delay, then when you enter into Sha'ban, complete your fast that you've missed. But best is as soon as Ramadan's over, as soon as you've finished from Eid and celebrations, complete whatever you missed from Ramadan, and then you can also hit Shawwal. In this month of Ramadan, it's important for us that we seek knowledge. And Alhamdulillah, this is one of the reasons why you're here today, to learn about Ramadan, our obligation, our duties, our responsibilities in this month, so that we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the correct way not based on doubts and uncertainties, but based upon sure knowledge. Knowledge of the rulings of fasting, and of course, knowledge of the virtues, the fadail of the month of Ramadan. In this month, what we should be doing is any task we've got that we need to do, any task which would distract us from carrying out or from, from having the benefit of this month, that would take time. Try to prioritize beforehand. I'll do these things, get them out of the way. Once they're done, the month of Ramadan. It could be work priorities, it could be school, college, it could be housework priorities. So getting those things out of the way or setting tasks according to a timetable where you can have enough time to do your ibadat of, of the worshipping in the month of Ramadan. Anything that could distract you from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this month, we need to sit with our families with our children and tell them about the rulings. Teach them what breaks the fast. Teach them things that we should do. Teach them the things that we should stay away from. And especially the young ones. The young ones, we should encourage them to fast. Give them something as an in incentive. It doesn't mean that they do it only for that thing, of course, like a prize or a chocolate or a sweets, whatever, but an incentive to say, oh, well done, my son or my daughter. That was excellent. You know, even encourage them to do half fast. I remember when I was small, okay, fasting wasn't obligatory at that time, but my parents, they would say, keep a half fast today. Now, of course, there's no such thing as a half fast. It's a fast or nothing. But of course, for children, it's a way to encourage them because it might be difficult for them to keep the whole fast. So today, you know, summertime, days are long, nights are short. So, this is tarbiyah. This is the training of children from a young age. So when they get older, they'll be accustomed to it. They'll be used to it. And it will not be difficult for them. We should have books in the home where members of family can read. Maybe we don't all have access to going out to the circles of knowledge or to listen. But if there's something, some leaflets about Ramadan, so in their spare time, it could be your wife, it could be your sister, your mother, she's doing something while she's doing something in the house. At least you can pick it up. Maybe it's a five minute read. Something to have knowledge for you in this month of Ramadan. Of course, you're rewarded for even if you picked up a paper and read something from it for five minutes, there's reward for that. Similarly, Islamic centers, masajid, could have leaflets to give out. Or you yourself, if you want to get rewards, photocopy something, it could be just a half page, it could be one dua, give to people. 
And every single person who reads that and benefits from that, you will get the rewards of that, inshallah ta'ala. We talked about the month of Sha'ban, that this is good to fast in this month as a preparation for Ramadan. And we mentioned the hadith where the Prophet used to complete the fast of Sha'ban. Most of it, save a little of it. Al-Qur'an, subhanallah. Many of us do not find the time to pick up the Qur'an. It stays on the shelf, except maybe on Fridays. We take it down, we take it, open up the cover, uh, and we read Surah Al-Kahf, if we can. Subhanallah, Shahr Ramadan. This is the month of the Qur'an. We should be reciting it. Our lips, our tongues should be moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what better month to recite the Qur'an than in this month? In fact, this preparation of reading Quran, reciting it, if you go back to our Salaf al-Salihin, from them, they would recite more in the month of Sha'ban, as such as Salama ibn Kuhayl said, it was said that Sha'ban was a month of the Quran readers. Amr ibn Qais would close his shop and would free his time, especially for reading Quran. So we need to put time there for Quran. From now, we're in Sha'ban. Let us do something similar to them. Even if we put down five minutes every single day, that five minutes, pure quality time, not disrupted by anything or distracted by anyone, reading Quran, even if it's only five minutes. And I'm sure each and every one of us, each and every one of us can find five minutes. The month of the Ramadan, there is a lot of discussion and debates. Some people say, well, we're going to follow this country, we're going to follow that country, we're going to follow this timetable, we're going to calculate it. Subhanallah. If you want the answer, refer back to Allah and His Messenger. If you defer in anything amongst yourselves, refer back to Allah and His Messenger. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? That whosoever amongst you sees, you witness it, mushahada, okay? Then this is the month of Ramadan beginning. You observe the siyam, you observe the fasting from that time. And this is the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we take for our months. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَهِلَّةِ they ask you, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi about the new moons. Say, these are signs to mark fixed periods of time for mankind and for the pilgrimage. So we shouldn't be relying on timetables. In fact, some of the scholars, they forbid this, to rely on calculations and timetables. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has commanded us to witness it, to witness it for yourselves. We have evidence from the Sunnah because there's a lot of debate on these things. The Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? He said to us, fast when you see it, meaning the new moon, and break the fast when you see it. In another hadith, hadith of Ibn Abar who said, the people went out to sight the new moon. And I told the Messenger of Allah وسلم, that I had seen it, so he fasted and told the people to fast. So when you hear news, that the moon has been sighted by trustworthy people. Don't wait to say, well, I'm waiting for this country. I'm waiting for the telephone call to come through. Subhanallah, if you receive that news from a trustworthy person, say, Alhamdulillah, and begin your fasting. Don't say, well, I'm waiting for my country to fast. Huh? We're going to be with those with brothers. Huh? All our family members, we all fast together. No, I can't go against the jama'ah. Subhanallah. Here came the news to you, what Allah said, what the Prophet said, and we're still going to wait on the phone call to come from that person and this person. MashaAllah. That's following Allah and His Messenger, isn't it? No, it's not. We should have no resistance in this matter. As soon as we hear that news, Alhamdulillah. The obligation of fasting. Okay. We're going to be looking at who are the people who are obliged to fast. Those people who have to fast. No excuses. And also the categories of people who are exempted, who don't have to fast. The people who have to fast, who are they? Number one, anybody who is a Muslim. Number two, anybody who is mukallaf. Mukallaf means accountable. Number three, the one who is able to fast. There's nothing preventing them health-wise and so forth. That he's muqim, he's settled, not a traveler, not musafir. 
and there are no impediments to fasting, nothing to prevent them from doing the fast. Let's expand on this. The first point, only a Muslim's fast will be accepted. A non-Muslim, if they fast, there may be some benefit for them in terms of health-wise, but it will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا مَنَعَهُمْ أَن تُقْبَلَ مِنْهُمْ نَفَقَاتُهُمْ إِلَّا أَنَّهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَبِرَسُولِهِ وَلَا يَأْتُونَ الصَّلَاةَ إِلَّا وَهُمْ كُسَالَ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَ إِلَّا وَهُمْ كَارِهُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and nothing prevents their contributions from being accepted from them except that they disbelieved in Allah. They did what? They disbelieved. They did not believe in Allah. They were not believers. They were not Muslims. So if you're not a Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept your actions. They'll be wasted of no benefit. So Muslim is a condition. Second condition, that the person should be mukallaf, accountable. Mukallaf means that a person's reached the age of puberty. In terms of the signs of puberty, what we should know is nocturnal emissions, wet dreams, the growth of coarse hairs around the private parts, pubic hair, or reaching the age of 15. The scholars, they said, once an individual reaches the age of 15, they're considered to be baligh, having reached the age of puberty. Whether or not those signs are manifested or not, 15 years, that's the age. From that point onwards, they're considered to be mukallaf. And of course, in the case of females, the fourth sign, which is menstruation, hayd. The third condition that they should be able to fast. Why? Because the one who is unable to fast, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hold him to account for what he can't bear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden a soul more than they can bear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that, and whoever is ill or on a journey, the same number of days which one did not observe the fasts must be made up from other days. So, the condition is that you should be able to fast. You should be settled, muqeem, not traveling. Why? Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those who are exempt, okay, are the ones who are, what? Ill or on a journey. Allah says, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ those who are ill or on a journey, then they don't observe the siyam, they don't observe the fasting, they make that up later. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this as a mercy for us. Allah says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not kill yourselves, don't kill one another. Surely Allah is most merciful to you. The fifth condition, there should be no impediments. Nothing to prevent you from carrying out the fast, such as for, specific for women, is menstruation, istihadah and hayd, or bleeding following childbirth, nifas. Istihada is the blood that comes, which is not natural blood of menstruation, but excessive blood flow. Those who are exempted because they're unable to fast comes under to or under a, a broad heading. We will call these inability. We can subdivide this in two groups. A temporary inability and also a permanent inability. The temporary inability here is a person, let's say, who's sick or a traveler. But that sick person, inshallah, will get better. Could be common cold, could be measles, mumps, whatever, chicken pox, all the childhood diseases you get, or worse than. May Allah keep us safe from those. Things. So this is a temporary inability that there will be recovery, or you can make up those fasts, it shouldn't be a problem with you. And then there's permanent inability. This is a person who is sick and has no hope of recovery. It could be terminal cancer, for example. Or those who are elderly and can't fast. Their health will not allow it to. They cannot fast. So these come under what was known as the permanent inability. Now, there are legitimate reasons lawful reasons where you can be excused from not fasting and they're the following sickness if you're sick you're exempted from that if you're traveling the traveler Allah has given a license a special dispensation 
that you don't have to fast whilst you're traveling. When you finish, you can make them up later. Those who are women, of course, pregnant or breastfeeding. Because the scholars said they fall under the catch of somebody who is ill. So for them, there is an exemption from fasting. Those who are senile, who reach old age and cannot think for themselves, they don't have the faculty of reasoning. They act like little children, they don't know what's happening around them. Fifth one, intense hunger and thirst. And six is compulsion. We'll go through each one, inshallah, individually. Sickness, what does that mean? If you are sick and you fasted, you'll be made worse. Okay, each and every one of us knows if we're sick or not. That if you fasted, then your recovery will take longer. So you won't be, you'll be delaying the, your recovery time. Or it will cause a very intense hardship for you, be difficult for you. Even if it doesn't make the sickness worse or delayed recovery, but it'll be a hardship for you. Also here, scholars included, those who fear that they become sick because of fasting. I'll give an example, diabetes. For some people, if they fast, it may affect. In other people, it doesn't affect, depending on their severity by which they are uh, suffering from it. And this is the ayah regarding it. Now, when you're ill, or you're fasting, when you're fasting, or you're a traveler, do you do fidya, or making up? Fidya means to pay a, a certain amount of money to feed a poor person for the, for the day that you missed. So every day you missed, you'd pay a person. Or you'd, sorry, you'd feed a person. So is the fidya or is it making up? It's a question we're going to ask. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran that observing fast for a fixed number of days, but if any of you is, on a, is ill or on a journey, the same number should be made up from other days. And for those who can, and as for those who can fast with difficulty, they have a choice either to fast or feed a poor person. So initially this ayah was revealed that if you found difficulty or a journey, then you could feed a poor person instead of making the fast. However, the ayah that comes second, verse 2, 185, sorry, ayah, Surah Baqarah, ayah 185, that whoever is ill on a journey, the same number of days which one did not observe must be made up from other days. So that, that license of doing fidyap, Paying or uh, feeding a person for the fast you, you uh, for the fast you missed, that was abrogated, cancelled out. If you're not in one of those categories where you're severely ill, you can't you know recover. Then, if you're ill with a temporary illness or you are a traveller, there is no fidya for you. You can't feed a person instead of fasting. You have to make the days up afterwards. We talked about travelling. That the one who is travelling, who is that person? When does he get that concession? When is he allowed to not fast? Following conditions, the journey has to be long enough that prayers can be shortened. Now this is itself in fiqh, there's difference in opinion. However, from what we know the scholars in this country, the distance is approximately 48 miles. Okay, this is the distance. But with that, you must have made the intention to be a traveler. So you packed your bags, your clothes, your food, etc. But that is the, what the scholars say, the traveling distance of this country. 48 miles or 46 plus one or two miles alam, no difference there secondly that you don't intend to settle in the place where you're traveling to that you're going to go there and come back thirdly that journey must not be for a sinful purpose someone's going to Las Vegas trying to hit the jackpot there now the billah uh, or to see some girl that he likes it's haram if she's not his wife so here, the journey must be a lawful journey as well. Not something to undertake, something which is not allowed in Islam, haram. Settling means, yani just, that's it, you've ended the story, you've stopped traveling. Settling here, yeah. when you say muqim, that you, you're now no longer a traveler. However, some scholars did say that a person can still remain a traveler up to six months. If they have that intention, even up to a year, some scholars, they said, that if a person is going, you know, that he's going to be the only for a specified period of time, but his intention is not to settle there, to do something, for some job or something, and he's coming back, he may shorten the prayer as a traveler. Allahu When you cease to be a traveler, okay, your concession, your allowing to not fast, or your allowing, allowance not to fast will stop. As soon as you become a resident again. So when you return back from your journey or you reach the place and now you're not traveling, you're going to be staying there as a resident. 
you've unpacked your stuff and you're going to be staying there for whatever, months, years, whatever. If that's the intention then, you will not be able to have the concession of not fasting and making the days up afterwards. So when, when you return home, when you come back to your hometown, your boundaries of your town, this is where you reside. You're not allowed to shorten your prayers anymore. You're not allowed to not fast. You have to now fast from the point onwards. So we mentioned this, that when the traveler decides to stay indefinitely or for a lengthy period in one place, and the place is fit for settling in. Those who are pregnant and breastfeeding, which is women of course, the Prophet ﷺ said, in the meaning of the hadith, Allah has relieved the traveler of half of the prayer and of the duty to fast, and has relieved pregnant and nursing mothers of the duty to fast. So if a woman is expecting or she's feeding, then she has that license, that allowance of not to fast, but to make up the days later. Senility we talked about, when a person reaches old age and they can't reason, they've lost that intellectual ability and old age. What does that mean, senility and old age? One who is old, has lost the strength. Somebody may be approaching death. Someone's becoming weaker daily, day by day. Somebody's suffering from a terminal illness such as cancer and they don't have any hope that they will recover from it. So these fall in that category. And the, 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 the Quranic ayah referring to senility in old age. And as for those who can fast with difficulty here, this means an old person. That if they fast, they will, not, they will not be able to bear it maybe. It'll be too difficult for them. So for that person, they have a choice either to fast or to feed a miskeen, a poor person, for every day that they miss. So this is an allowance for such people not to fast. Now here, intense hunger and thirst. Now when we mean that this is when you're in a situation where it's unbearable, you may collapse. Not, oh my stomach's rumbling, oh I need a burger. This is not intense hunger and thirst. We're literally talking, you know, you're, you're dizzy or whatever, you feel ill. If you don't eat something, you're gonna fall down. I mean excessive, I mean, we mean the word excessive. Uh, no playing around with this word, by the way. Uh, no shortcuts. Excessive means it's gonna be unbearable. You simply can't ca carry on unless you have something. And it happens sometimes. It happens for people who maybe become dehydrated. Okay, it could be in terms of a person who's, as I said, who's diabetic. They tried to fast and they went okay throughout half the day and then suddenly they're feeling dizzy, the sugar went low, became hypoglycemic. They have to have something, they have to break that fast. Otherwise, they're harming themselves. Also, the fear of weakness when meeting, when meeting the enemy. This is for those who are fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they have to have their strength when they meet the enemy. If they're weak, that's not a good battle they'll be able to fight. So for those people, there's an exemption. And of course, also those fearing or expecting an attack. So if they're in a battlefield, yes, they may have that license not to fast as well. Allah Alam. Compulsion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا إكراف الدين there is no compulsion in the religion, okay? If somebody forces somebody to do something which is against their wishes, they didn't want to do it. Then of course, they are not accountable for the action. So if it's something was done under, let's say somebody, I'm going to a very, a very, very uh, uh, extreme scenario, okay? Let's say somebody uh, was, uh, was captured and the person had a gun to someone's head and say, drink this, eat this or I'm going to kill you. Because he just wants you to make, you know, make, humiliate you, say you're fasting, I know so I'm going to make you eat instead. instead. Some people are sick and you know, like that, they may do that. In this case, a person has to break their fast and eat and drink. That's, because this is now under compulsion. They didn't do it of their own accord. So for that person, if they eat or drink, they're not sinful for that situation. That is a, an extreme situation, but it is a, nonetheless something which has to be taken into account. An insane person, of course, is not accountable for their actions. So until they return back to sanity, there's no fast for that person or a young person who's not reached puberty. However, you know, as we said, we should, we should encourage the young children to fast. And the Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them, they used to do that. They used to take children and give them a corn, little, little dolls to play with, okay, just to spend the time. And they would train the children this way. So similarly, from a small age, we should try to encourage our children to do similar. Allah subhanahu wa uh, uh, the Prophet said that the pen has been lifted from three, from the insane person until he comes back to his senses, from the sleeper until he wakes up, and from the minor until he reaches puberty. 
So within these categories of people, they're also exempted from fasting. Okay, now we're going to look at some of the actions which will nullify the fast. Those actions which break the fast. Actions such as anything which is secreted, okay, from the private parts in terms of due to intercourse, due to uh, arousal. If somebody deliberately vomits, menstruation, and also, according to one opinion, cupping as well. Secondly, if anybody takes any substances intentionally, eating and drinking intentionally, then of course these will also break the fasts. In total there are seven things which break the fast. Intercourse, masturbation, eating and drinking, anything which has a similar connotation that falls in the heading of eating and drinking, letting blood by means of cupping, and again there is some difference in opinion between scholars regarding this, vomiting deliberately, and menstruation and nifas, post childbirth bleeding. Intercourse is the most serious of the things that break the fast. Why? Because it's, we're supposed to be guarding against our desires. When we fast, we're not fasting just against the food, but we are fasting against our lusts and desires. So the one who goes against that has willfully gone against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written for you not to do. And in the hadith of the Prophet Sallam, in the hadith of Abu Harirah who said that the message, he said, a person came to the Prophet Sallam and said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I'm doomed. He said, why is that? He said, I had intercourse with my wife when I was fasting. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do you have a slave whom you can set free? He said, no. He said, can you fast for two consecutive months? One month after the straight away. He said, no. He said, can you afford to feed 60 poor persons? He said, no. Then a man from them among the Ansar brought a basket of dates. He said, take this and give it in charity. The man said, to someone poorer than us, O Messenger of Allah, by the one who sent you with the truth, there is no family. There is no family between the two lava fields, meaning in Medina, poorer than us. So the Prophet ﷺ said, go and feed it to your family. Because of course, Sadaq and Zakah, your family has a greater right than before anyone else. Secondly, masturbation. Now, it is a topic that many people do not want to talk about or shy away from, but the deen, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with all aspects. And even though it's a topic which is taboo, it happens amongst the youth, amongst the elders, males and females. Therefore, it is a knowledge which we should know that yani, anybody who purposefully makes himself to ejaculate or for a woman to come to orgasm for that person it will break the fast because the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith Qudsi are clear regarding the fasting person he gives up his food and drink and desire for my sake so the one who didn't do this as we mentioned before as I said they have directly disobeyed Allah azawajal, have disregarded what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to do and that is a very, very sinful thing to do. Especially in this month of Ramadan where we're supposed to be gaining taqwa and being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person ate or drank, okay, and this was done intentionally, in that case, that will break the fast. Or anything else that goes via the stomach or the nose, some people snuff. Okay, those stuff Allah, some people do drugs, they snort cocaine or whatever. All this, as it goes down into the nasal passage or into the mouth, into the esophagus, all these things will break the fast. And the Prophet said, even as regards to making wudu, when you put the water into your nose, that normally we should do it deeply, so the water goes right up the nose. But here, the Prophet told us that when we are fasting, we should not do it deeply then. Snuff up water deep into the nose when do wudu, except when you're fasting, to prevent the water going down. If accidentally it went down, then you're not accountable for that. But as a precaution, when we're fasting, we shouldn't make the water go too high up into our nose. And we've talked about anything which is regarded as, you know, coming close to eating and drinking. Scholars talked about this, they said blood transfusions, especially where somebody is given nutrients. 
The majority opinion is that such a transfusion would actually invalidate the fast because it serves the same purpose as food and drink. We eat food and we drink in order to give nourishment, vitamins and minerals to our body. So this transfusion, if it has a similar thing, then of course that has the same, and it's the same, uh, same reason. And therefore, on that basis, it would invalidate the fast. Receiving via needle in case of a drip, nourishing substance such as a glucose drip, same, uh, same category that it is considered to break the fast as well. Letting blood by means of cupping. The Prophet said, the cupper and the one from cupping is done have both invalidated the fast. So whilst we are fasting, we should not do hijama. Okay, this should not be done whilst we are fasting based on the hadith which is authentic. If a person deliberately vomited, okay, that person will not have to make up the fast. Sorry, if a person accidentally vomited, they're feeling ill, they don't make up the fast just for being sick. But if a person forced themselves, like some people you find they, I don't know, to keep the weight down or whatever, they put the fingers in their mouth, blah, it comes out. Yeah, this is a psychological illness, I think, as well. But here, a person intentionally did it, it will break their fast as well. And we talked about the blood of the menses, menstruation and nifas. Here, the same ruling applies that when she cannot pray her salah, she cannot also fast the month of Ramadan. For that person, she's to make it up after uh, Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, we come to the end of our first session. Um, I've been asked to give a few tips on Ramadan as well. And this is to encourage us to meet this month and make it more fruitful for us. First and foremost, I'm sorry I don't have it on the PowerPoint, I didn't have time to uh, put it with the PowerPoint. Uh, but I'll tr we'll try to have this uh, PowerPoint on the website, inshallah, as well as these tips as well, bi-idhnillah. First and foremost, when we come into Ramadan, we should have a plan. A plan why? We would like to give ourselves a target. How we're going to start Ramadan. Things that we'd like to accomplish in Ramadan, to do in Ramadan, and to have completed by the end of Ramadan. You could say personal goals and targets related to our Iman, related to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could be in terms of recitation of Quran, how much we recite. It could be in terms for some of us to making the salah in jama'ah. Maybe we find difficulty sometimes that we can't catch the salah in jama'ah. So we'll make a concerted effort that we will try to, not to be as lazy. Sometimes we're lazy. We try to find excuses. So maybe it's having that as a target to try to catch all five salah. In fact, as Muslims, we should be having all five salah in the masjid. But today is difficult. We need encouragement. We should be helping each other, asking akhirins in the masjid. Sometimes people get offended by this, but no, we shouldn't. It should be an encouragement for us. That if I don't turn up to the masjid in salah, what will people think? Well, it actually should be not what people think, or what Allah think. Because we're not doing for people. We do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could be in terms of charity. Increasing the charity we're giving. It could be a plan for re-establishing ties of kinship. Maybe we've fallen out with members of our family. So what better month than this month to re-establish those ties? It could be, I only see my mother or my father once a week. Well, let me in Ramadan twice a week. I'll go after work and on the weekend as well. Or maybe I'll go every single day. Subhanallah, wouldn't that make your parents happy? Especially if they're in old age. To visit with your children, if you have children. Re-establish those ties of kinship. We should start this month with Tawbah. Repentance, we talked about early on. Why? We want to enter into Ramadan upon a high. Upon hope, Allah's forgiving our sins, or has forgiven our sins, and we come with a clean slate. Simple. Make wudu. Two rakat, salat tawbah. If you do an, an action which is wrong, and you know that's wrong, that's all it takes. In fact, if I remember the hadith, or meaning the hadith correctly, that between a sin that was done, if it was done within six hours, 
this Salah Tawbah, they will be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Six hours. Subhanallah. So we should be looking towards Tawbah before we enter this month. Even if you're in a condition or if you're in a situation where you're unable to fast, it doesn't matter. Alhamdulillah. Maybe by not fasting, you can do something else in that day. Maybe you can read Quran. Maybe you can do something Islamic work. Maybe you can give out literature. Something for Islam and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the deen of Allah. Just because you can't fast, don't lose up hope, but don't think I'm not going to get my rewards. There are alternatives. So look for alternatives of what you can do. Cleansing our hearts. Cleansing from hatred, from envy. When we enter into this month, we try to enter with a clean, pure heart. Forgive everybody who's done harm to us. Doesn't matter what they said, what they did. Say, I forgive you for Allah's sake. Sincerely. Don't hold that grudge in your heart. And enter into Ramadan with that manner. Think of the things which will increase your taqwa. Okay, and aim for those things. Stop doing those things that may harm people, hurt people, lying, cheating, stealing, cursing, backbiting, gossiping, upset to anything that may harm or upset. Think, why am I doing that? I could do this to somebody. And stay away from those things. Give charity. Sadaqah extinguishes fire. Fire of Jahannam, Allah's punishment. As we mentioned, our salah, pay attention to it. In terms of getting them all protected, five daily prayers, and how we pray them with khushu, with concentration. Taraweeh. Try to attend the taraweeh as you can. Just a point here. The five daily prayers first, get them in the bag. You see people rushing and hastening towards taraweeh and they're not praying the five daily prayers which are the obligatory prayers. Where's the priority there? For sure. There's a great reward for praying taraweeh as you pray the whole night through. But the priority, first comes the obligatory prayers. Pray for others. Pray for others. Pray for yourself. But pray for others. Because when you do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends an angel who says, Wala mithl, and for you the same. So whatever dua you made for that person, that, that angel is asking the same for you. SubhanAllah. Read the Quran in this month. Utadabur. Ponder over it. Think. Try to understand its meanings. Read its translation. Read its tafsir. What those words of Allah mean. Why were they revealed? Remind yourself about death. Remind yourself that this is a fact that we'll all meet Allah. We say this every year. None of us knows who will be alive next year, young or old amongst us today. Whether it's yourself, whether it's myself. Anything could happen in that time period and we don't know who's, whose faces will be here next year. I don't want to go too much into detail with the other things because I think Sheikh Mas'ud when he comes, he's going to be touching upon some of those things. So in general, stay away from what is haram. Protect your eyes, protect your ears, protect your mouth. Think of the things which will cause Allah's anger. We know, you don't need the fatwa. Most people know what will make Allah angry. So stay away from those things, from your fitrah, you know, from your innate nature, you know. Think about yourselves that you are going to be accountable, muhasibah, that you're going to be held accountable for every single thing that you do and say. And when you do actions in the month of Ramadan, don't do it. So people say, oh, mashallah, look at this person, praise the long sujood. Oh, he puts his hands up. Oh, look at the way he's making his dua. Very nice dua as he makes. No, 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 no. What we do. It's between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the best thing, if you're going to do some actions of ibadah, try not to let other people see what you're doing even. Save the best between you and Allah. To save yourself falling into ar the shirk of showing off, doing an action for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the minor shirk. And of course, at the end of Ramadan, aim, aim to celebrate Eid, but in a halal way in a halal way. Be with family. Do something for the children. Subhanallah, you know, when you, when, when you go to schools, they have parties this day, party that day, for birthday parties, for Mother's Day, Father's Day, this day and every day. Subhanallah. 
Eid is a great day of blessing and joy for us. If they did that party, we should do much better than what they did, but without the haram that they do. We should make it a day where our children respect and they enjoy, where each other we enjoy. Do things, invite people, have fun. It's important for us to do things with family, with children. Otherwise, what's going to happen? We're going to always be comparing to, oh, we wish we were on that day, we were on that party. Make your party special. It doesn't mean be extravagant and, you know, go overboard with the wastefulness in, in, in spending and so forth. But make it a day for them to remember, especially for children. Those of you who have children, younger brothers and sisters, make it a day to remember that everybody chips in. Everybody is part of it. Not some people sit on the side and just reading newspaper like sometimes people do. No. Elders and youngsters together. Don't be us and them. Be as one, a family, and enjoy. After the blessed month of Ramadan, you've taken the benefit, inshallah. Enjoy some while. But of course, and I keep emphasizing it in a halal way, not in a haram way. Allahu alam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our efforts and that He blesses us and He guides us to what is true and of the haqq. Whatever good you've heard from today, inshallah, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever I may have said, which is incorrect or a mistake, this is a weakness from myself and from shaitan. And I will leave you here, bi